Today, Seahawks hiring Michael McDonald as head coach, the Ravens defensive coordinator, starting a new legion of boom for the Seahawks. All right, old guys, who's got a Michael McDonald yacht rock? Let me hear it. I keep forgetting not in love. There you go, Adonde. Let's go around the horn. Stone, you got it? What do you say? No. What do you say? You may go there. I dress for yacht rock. I don't sing yacht rock. There's a difference. I'm going to be there for any Michael McDonald reference, even though it oh, predates me a little bit, too. It's the NFL News of the Day. Seattle, Seattle Seahawks making their hire. Ravens defensive corner Michael McDonald, 36 years of age. The youngest head coach in the league now. First-time head coach, six-year deal. He was coordinator of the number one defense in football this past season. And boom, Seattle goes boom again in their post T. Carroll Legion. Clinton Yates around the horn to you on Seahawks hire Michael McDonald. I like this hire a lot. Oftentimes in the NFL, we think about teams who grab guys and you say, oh, that was a bizarre reach or another reach out of another person we've heard about for so long. This is a young man who's really built himself up in coaching circles and done quite well. Points per game, sacks, and takeaways. The Ravens, number one in all those. We're talking about a team that really put together a nice blend of rookies and veterans to get something out of that unit that ultimately did not cost him anything in the playoffs. So for me, I think this is a smart move for Seattle. You go from the oldest coach to the youngest coach and something to look forward to in the brand of football that you know that your fan base is used to. Good hire. Do you like that the defensive that. hire is it is their identity again for this franchise? Woody Page, how about you? Well, it has a, a past uh, uh, logo of being a great defensive team, and that's what they're trying to get back to that they had when they went to the Super Bowls. And you've got the best defensive coordinator in the league this year to come out to to, to Seattle, a guy who started coaching when he was a teenager because he had an injury when he was in high school and he became a high school coach while he was at Georgia and got a master's degree in sports management. Wiki Page here. Listen to this. In 2014 <laughs> with the Ravens, he's paved his way. Just because he's young, he's kind of a Mike McDaniel kind of hire, seems like to me, that they want to bring in the young guy who's going to bring back the kind of All defense right. that they once had. J.A. Adande on the Seahawks hire of Michael McDonald. It's the rare time that somebody's coming off a playoff loss and gets hired, and you're not looking back at the last playoff performance and going, hmm, I don't know, some questionable decisions out there. No, they, no, you're right. they held Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs to 17 points. It wasn't the defense that was the, the costly unit in that last game. It, it's funny. It kind of reminds me of the beginning of Pete Carroll's head coaching career when he was a young head coach, 43 years old, coaching the New York Jets. That didn't go so well, but it was the start of a great career for him, maybe to be the same thing well, I, for <laughs> Seattle, I hope, wants it to be a great career for him in Seattle. Kevin Black, I thought I turn to you. First, real quick, this landscape of coaching hires, right, it included some of the greatest names and the greatest name of all time, Bill Belichick, Pete Carroll, right. Mike Vrabel, right. and now we're right. seeing another team go away from that, Michael McDonald to Seattle. Your thoughts? Well, you know, for them, it might make sense. You're talking about the 25th worst defense in the league last year. You're talking about a defense that was 29th in defensive EPA the last three seasons. So this is one area that maybe a coach like this who's been as impactful doing what he does can make a real difference quickly. They can't change their offense. They've got a 33, 34-year-old quarterback in Geno Smith. Um, they don't draft until 16th in the first round. Who knows if you can get a quarterback that Ooh, late? A lot of cold water really you're pouring on this franchise right now. So, uh, well, I'm just saying they did what they what makes sense for them in their situation. So I'm not going to hate on them for going with a defensive guy and not going for one of those other more legendary uh, coaches that's out there. One franchise remaining. And so, does anybody know? You almost forget Washington still in need a bad coach. And there's been no leak here. We don't know who they like. We don't know if anybody likes them. Again, some of the greatest names of all time are out there. But there is there buzz here in your hometown, Kevin Blackstone, for the head coaching position of the Washington I, Commanders? I wouldn't say it's buzz. There's a lot of wonderment going on right now because it looked like that they were going to turn to Ben Johnson. Ben Johnson goes the other way. They interviewed Sloak. He's gone the other way. Everybody who they've tapped on the shoulder has seemed to go the other way. The only name left right now is Anthony Weaver, the assistant coach with the Ravens, who's a defensive guy, and Eric Bieniemy, who's right here in the house, who you would think who was brought in here to go from being OC to HC would make that leap. 
And they still haven't. They haven't committed to that. His no. year this year, the, the shine off of him in some Shaky. some degree. But Clinton, you're a native Washingtonian. We've heard two coordinators re refuse the job or, or pull their names out of the job. What does that mean? Nothing to wonder about at all, KB. It's one of the worst jobs in the NFL and has been Is so really? for 20 years. Two You're going to have to overpay in order to get the guy that you want. That's a fact. But the number two pick in a quarterback heavy draft and a new ownership and it's still one of the worst jobs. And a There's bottom only, 10 and a bottom 10 guys. offense with a terrible crumbling I mean stadium. Slate Trust me, is clean. Is about that. Yeah, I, I, got slate a is clean. Right, right. I'll swear. That could have been said for Houston last year. New coach, new quarterback, things can change, Clinton. This is your franchise, Clinton. Things can change. Have you been there recently? Come on. That's the whole point. If you've I'm already still got here. something I haven't you defected like, from going LA. there I'm is still not in the move, DC. Unless it's for big cash. We've been horned. We'll move on. Basketball now. Golden State 119. Sixers 107 last night. This is about Joel Embiid. He played, despite being a game time decision. And he played after two DMPs, but he looked slow and without explosion, had eight turnovers, some bumps. I'd call him fluky. Maybe you think of him otherwise with Draymond Green. And then caught under Kaminga, another fluky play. He went to the locker room and never returned. There's the oof of that, and that'll need an MRI now. But also this. This is my question. Is the pressure to play from the mocking he received for not playing Saturday in Denver and the 65-game rule putting him and the Sixers in a bad spot? Around the horn to you, Jay Adonde. Absolutely, and last night's games inadvertently turned into a showcase for the problems with this 65 game in them. Joel Embiid literally did more harm than good that, by being out there. Let's hope the MRI results aren't too bad. In the first game, the Pacers at the Celtics, you had Tyrese Halliburton, who clearly wasn't ready for a full return because he had a minutes restriction and couldn't finish the game, and they wound up losing. So if the NBA is going to entrust the media to determine what constitutes the most viable, the writers get to, the media gets to decide what's most viable. They should be able to decide how many games is sufficient. You're going to tell me if MB plays 64 games instead of 65, that would make that much of a difference of whether he should earn the MVP or not. And he's got to want it, right? He's played well enough to put himself in a conversation. You would hate to have it taken away because he can't play the minimum. But your read on this, it's more about the 65-game rule or about the scrutiny he's received in the last week, especially in that Denver game, J.A.? He can't make up for it. I mean, the 65-game rule, again, you don't want to waste an MVP-type season for this arbitrary number. Yeah, yeah. I don't think he was out there to prove anything. He said he can't prove anything to the people until he wins some more playoffs. Woody series. Page, uh, you were among the many voices after he ducked, was the popular word, but dnp versus Jokic in Denver on Saturday. Do you believe that's playing into him playing last night? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think it's been a case of you got Maxi out also that he had to feel like he wanted to come back against the Warriors. It was a game they could win on the road, unlike in Denver that it would be expected. He's only played here twice in his entire career. And, yes, I think he deserved to get uh, uh, chagrined about not playing here. And I think he came back and he's playing in Salt Lake City. Uh, supposedly tomorrow night, and that's not going to happen. I think he's going to be sidelined. But he said at the beginning of the year, the MVP, he's now won it. The only thing that matters is winning the championship. Right. They need to get him ready right. to play. That's what he has said. If he has injuries, but do you believe, yeah. and I turn to you, Clinton Yates, that the franchise and Embiid are viewing this differently now? They have said everything is about the, the playoffs and the championship. Him playing last night, less than 100% in your eyes? None of the logic adds up unless I have to believe that Joel Embiid himself said, I want to play in this game to figure out where I am. Because if you're not going to worry about public pressure from various opponents and people like Woody Page talking about it, you can't face Jokic, and you're not worried about the MVP race and the game is played, well, then why is he in this game at all? This struck me as particularly reckless for the Sixers who need him for this championship run. And listen, you can say that Draymond versus any other warrior is not really doesn't really matter. I'm not playing him in this game if I'm the Sixers. And I thought it was a really odd situation, and hopefully it turns out that He's okay. Kevin, do you believe the scrutiny is on there and or the 65-game rule put him on the court last night less than 
I don't think it. I don't think it did. I think more likely it was the fact they lost a few games in a row, and maybe he wanted to put a into that particular skid. I don't think there's a cause. There's causation between the 65 uh, game floor that is there now and that weird injury that happened to him last night. However, I will say this. When he just went down on his own and kind of grabbed that knee, which he rested the last couple of games, um, I think I would have taken him out the game right Right, that now. was when it was uh, underneath the rim. He went up for a block. There was no contact, yep. and he's grabbing at his leg. Adonda, I'll give you the last word on Joel Embiid. You almost wonder, you know, if Maxi was out, if you, you just write this off as, as a schedule loss, you know, you're, you're on the road. Mm -hmm. And rather than going out and forcing it, just say, hey. Wasn't well, that what they did in Denver, done, though? Right? And that's when he took all the heat from Woody Page. Woody, I'll give you the last word at the horn. Yeah, I felt sorry for him last night. He came out, and you could tell right away. I mean, he ended up going, what, 5 for 17? He wasn't ready to play. He was shooting three-pointers and mid-range jumpers, and he should have gotten taken out of the game earlier. But Nurse said, well, we're following the procedures that we always have. You should stop following those procedures then. Wait on the MRI. We'll take a break right now. Buy or sell next. Sleep, sleep. Hawks 138, Lakers 122. Like sands through the hourglass. LeBron emoji. Oh. What does it mean? <laughs> Two games ago, LeBron just about as mad as we've ever seen him on the court. Last night's response in 16-point loss to Atlanta was the emoji and this after the game. On any given night, beat any team in the NBA. And then on any given night, we get out of the by any team in the NBA. Clinton, where are we with LeBron and the Lakers today? He's right. These are the days of our lives, but unfortunately, there's not a lot that the Lakers can do about it. They're maxing them out in terms of minutes. This team isn't very good. AD doesn't play enough. And for all these Laker fans who seem to think that there's this talent rotating out there in the universe, who are you going to get? Who are you going to trade for him? And how's that going to happen? This is a team that just plain needs to get better, but this is also why I think they're a better playoff team than they are night to night against different opponents. Well, that's interesting, and that, that's LeBron's point, that we could beat anybody in any night, and you think in the playoffs. Yeah. You say AD doesn't play enough. Uh, you know who's played the most games in the NBA over the last calendar year in 12, in 12 months? Anthony Davis. I'm a test. Yeah. Okay, how about that? So, Woody Page, to you. Two points to be made before the season. LeBron said, this is now Anthony Davis's team. Problem is, Anthony Davis has missed three games, and they lost all three of them. The other point was, Devin Ham said, we're going to uh, reduce his time to 28 to 30 minutes. Well, guess what? He's only played less than 30 minutes in nine games this year. He's averaging almost 35 minutes a game. So those are the problems. He's noticing that he's getting close to the end of his career, uh, and he better have a team around him that can do it. I, it almost makes sense, Tony, that he would be asking for a trade to a team that can win the championship. Oh, is that how you interpret the emoji? All right. Well, some have suggested that before. Jay, Adonde, you're reading this. Now, Tony, you ask where we are. We're, we're getting near the All-Star break, and it's the time of the season when LeBron tends to send out his passive-aggressive tweets or his statements. Remember, that was the time when, when he had the Kevin Love fit-in, fit-out tweet, or a couple years ago in Cleveland when he kind of mused about finishing his career back there. He's not going in there. He does want to make sure the Lakers are, you know, looking over it, under every stone and all that stuff to do the best they can to improve the team, but it doesn't mean he wants out. Kevin Black is tough. I mean, it just means that time is running out, not only on the team, but also on his career. And I think, you know, I, I think the, the ability to make a change this time is, is even less. So they're in a real pickle. And no, we didn't mention uh, the criticism of Darvin, Darvin Ham as well. I mean, he's been picked apart for the lineups that they put out there, for who he started, who he hasn't started, and how that's impacted the win-loss record for this Just year. give me one move they can make, though. I, I, I mean, you always hear they're, they're linked to every player, and then it's just like the offer they could put out there doesn't even rise to the occasion. Clinton, I'll give you the last word here. That's what I'm saying. This is kind of a solutionless problem. Unfortunately, LeBron is basically their best talent evaluator that they have, but he's also <laughs> their best player on their team in the overall administration of the business. So that's a difficult situation. Fire sale, too. The team with the best record in January in the league. Anybody? It's right there on the screen, people. The New York Knickerbockers. It's time we talk about the Knicks. Eight straight wins, 14-2 and two in January throttling people since the OG on an OB trade, and now winning without Julius Randle, whose injury has him out, but is not as severe as it could have been. It's going to be shorter than weeks or months. So, Woody, 
Will you dare call these Knicks the scariest team in the Eastern Conference? In the Eastern Conference, but, but not in the NBA. Those Clippers are about to become the first place team in the Western Conference. And the Knicks are frightening to opponents winning eight in a row and having that great record in the month. But without Randall with that shoulder injury, that begins to scare me a little bit of how long he's going to be out because they've had a really good run here. Right, but they've been fought. You look at the, the plus minus even without Randall the last couple of games, Woody. And I'm not going to allow a one seat to be the scariest team in the NBA or a two seat. I'm talking about a bit further down the menu. Jay Dada to you. I mean, I'll, I'll give you a bing bong or a Knicks tape or whatever, you know, if it'll make you feel better. But look, this is what they do. Tiff teams, they play harder than you during the regular season. You catch teams traveling, they're hanging out in New York. You can get them. The question is, can they make it work in the postseason when everybody is playing hard and is locked in? And to date, I don't think they will. Devin Blackstone. Well, I love the way they're grinding. I mean, you add the real OG to that team, and all of a sudden they're, what, 12, 13, and 2? Not only that, they moved up to be the best defensive team in the league with OG. Not only that, they've scored 130 points at least twice since he's been there, which is something that they don't do. So now they got a little extra offense. They've tightened it up on defense. This is a team to be af afraid of. And Yates. Yeah, they're flat out a better team with OG, and they have somewhat of an identity. KB sucks, you know, touched on a little bit in terms of their spacing offensively and defensively, and they're not just a guy, the team with a bunch of left-handers and a bunch of dudes from Villanova, which, by the way, has worked very well. It's something I like about that. It did work well. They You're genuinely right. they like each other, the and league. there is a bond there. Yeah. It works. Woody, I'll give you a laugh. Good job. Good job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, goodbye. Well, okay, that's your last word. <laughs> what do you think the Nuggets are scary? He thinks the Celtics are scary. And he th he's, you're not wrong, but in that particular question, what he particularly looking for a team below the, the fold a little bit. Thank you, Clinton. Thank you, Woodrow. J.A. Adane and Kevin Blackstone showing it down like it's 2002. Let's go around the horn. Pro Bowl. Patrick Mahomes out. The Super Bowl. Lamar Jackson opting out after playing last week. Josh Allen was the first alternate, but he's scheduled to golf in the Pebble Beach Pro Am. So Gardner Minshew in a Pro Bowl selection for the Pro Bowl games. What's the word, JA, for a golfer opt out, a Gardner opt in? <laughs> Let's have fun. I mean, this is not a serious competitive event so it should be as fun as possible can we mic up Gardner Minshew if it's not going to be the best quarterbacks playing in it let's have the most fun and I think Gardner Minshew can make I think it we can mic him up please. absolutely yes and you gotta mic him up and this is one of the best uh, personalities in the league everybody likes Gardner Minshew everybody sprout a mustache just for the game who's going to grow the best mustache I think that's all in play here I love the move of you Gardner love the move like last year it was absolutely Tyler Huntley who the backup for Baltimore played four games, made a Pro Bowl. You, you love this? That Gardner Minshew, if he's mic'd up, you guys are buying it. We'll split the point. We'll move on. Showdown two. If you're trying to go onto the other team's designated area, you kind of stay out of their way. That is the unwritten rule. That's the unwritten rule. If you want to be a dick about it, you keep your helmet and your football and your kicking tee <laughs> right where the quarterbacks are warming up. And that's where we are today now. I mean, this story is going on and on and on. Mahomes and Kelsey versus Justin Tucker. Tucker saying it was pre-pregame, and that's where he can be. Kevin, who you got? You know, just when I thought I'd ha had enough of Travis Kelsey, I really haven't had enough of Travis you Kelsey. Like Thank you very much for that explanation of the unwritten rule. I couldn't find it anywhere in the rule book I was looking at the other day. So now he has explained it to me, and it makes absolutely perfect sense. Yeah, Donna. Can, can we write a rule that kickers have priority in the pregames? How many times have you heard reference of what the kicker was able to do in the weather conditions or against the wind kicking to this end of the stadium? Pre-game matters more for kickers than it actually does for quarterbacks who aren't facing defenses or anything like that. So that one-yard line stretch that Justin Ticker, Tucker was doing? That's... The whole field. It's their uh, field pre-game. You know, kickers matter pre-game. I, I think there was a real attitude adjustment that Kelsey brought when they showed up in black and when he did that <laughs> to Tucker. We'll give the point to Stone. We'll move on. Ole Miss 86, Mississippi State 82. This was a thrilling, heated rivalry game. And in a rivalry game, you take anything you can get to get the crowd going. Second half, look at this. There's a wet spot on the floor.
Why not? I love the energy that that kid brought to that game. Come on, that's great stuff. Working for my man Jim Zook, spokesperson for Ole Miss. That was poetic, beautiful. The dancing, the I energy. Credit I credit Kyle it. Wakefield Your with that win. win for Ole Miss, and I credit Kevin Blackstone for this win. Thirty seconds of baseball. One more word on Ben Johnson staying in Detroit. Good for the city of Detroit. Just a reminder that it is no longer the city that's just falling apart. It is overcoming that largest municipal bankruptcy in the history of U.S. and the history of this country that it had. People are actually coming back to Detroit now, and that's why I like this for them. Put that place back on the map. Cadillac Hotel, beautiful place. Love it. It was always on a map. Yeah, it's I mean, no I think that's the whole point. It's no Kurdistan, is it, KB? It's always on a map. <laughs> <laughs>